It's, it's just a catchy tune. It puts a smile on my face. There's nothing we can do about it. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm excited to be your host. I've got the best freaking job in the world. I'm Jim Reed, Blusterini in the home game, and at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. And speaking of the home game, this is a special edition of the podcast. We're going to be talking about the mixed game of the month, stud eight or better. Um, but before I get into that, I have to mention that we're brought to you by Running Aces, the official sponsor of the Rec Poker Podcast. And uh, we really depend on the support from our sponsors and our premium members because most of what we do here is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization, and you can get a free account at Rec Poker yourself by just heading on over. All it takes is an email address and a smile, although we do insist on both. And if you want to take your game to the next level, join our premium membership and get involved with some of our training material. It's only 15 bucks a month, and you can get your first month for only 5 bucks when you use the code RECPOKER at checkout. Now, you get used to hearing my voice on Mondays because they let me host the show, but I am just one of the guys and gals on the Wrecking Crew, which is what we call our leadership panel here at Wreck Poker, and I am privileged to be joined by several Wrecking Crew members tonight on the show. If you want to find out more about me or the rest of the Wrecking Crew, you can go to wreck.poker slash crew, but you can also just listen up because you can meet a few of them tonight, starting with John Somsky. I'm John Somsky, also known as Poker Geek MN Everywhere, and I coordinate our home games. And I'm Rob Watson. You can find me as Rabman50, just about everywhere. And you can also join us for our book studies on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. I'm Taylor Moss. You can find me on Twitter at Taylor underscore Moss or as Gopherboy TJM in the Rec Poker home game, which I stream live uh, Wednesday evenings, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central at twitch.tv slash recpoker. And home games are just one of the perks of getting involved in our free membership here. And I mentioned at the top, we're doing our different featured mixed game of the month every month in 2024. On the second Wednesday of the month, you get to play a different mixed game every month in our player of the year race. And so every month we're releasing a podcast episode going over some strategy tips for how players that are new to this particular mixed game can get the most out of it. So We'll be releasing these on Tuesday, and if I did my math right, uh, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, should be the first practice mixed game for Stud 8 or Better, which is the game that we'll be playing on the second Wednesday of next month. So, John Somsky, you've been putting this fantastic slate of mixed games together. We've been building on concepts from month to month, and we've gotten to Stud 8 or Better Tell us a little bit about uh, how to get the most out of this fantastic mix game. So the new concept that is coming in here, this is the first stud variant. It's a seven card stud game. Unlike most of the other games that we play, this game actually has five betting rounds rather than four. Um, what happens is you are dealt and you have, there's no shared cards. Everyone has their own cards. And you have some cards that are down, meaning only you know what they are, and some cards that are played face up that the entire table knows what they are. So you start off, in this game, it also is played with antis rather than blinds. So everyone will typically ante. Um, and then and the ante size is usually anywhere from 10% to... 25% of whatever the um, small bet would be. Uh, and you do have small bet and big bet concepts. So you start off, you're dealt three cards. Two of them are down, private to you, one card up. That goes all the way around. And then the best card is the one that start, or actually the worst card is the one that has to do the bring in. In, and you mean the, the lowest ranking card or the... In this particular case, it's low because in eight or better, the nice part about it is there. it's another split pot game just like we played last month in Omaha where the high wins half the pot and low wins half the pot. So the low cards aren't necessarily bad, but that still has a forced bring in. So that's the only forced, well, that and the blinds, I guess. But it's a forced bet. 
And you'll typically do a bring in or you can complete a complete, meaning that you uh, go all the way to the small bet size, whatever that is. And they'll, whenever you're playing a stud game or tournament, it'll be well listed what the ante is, what the bring in is, what the small bet is, and what the big bet is. And typically the big bet is double whatever the small bet is. So you're, you're dealt uh, three cards, one up, one down. Whoever is the bring in has, whoever has the lowest card showing, and it's if two people have a deuce, which is the lowest card, then you go to a tiebreaker, which is suits. And the uh, deuce, it's reverse alphabetical order for the rank. So, spades are deuce the of clubs. So deuce of clubs. Thank deuce you. Deuce of clubs is the lowest possible. <laughs> clubs, you diamonds, played it more often space. have it memorized, and, or my brain <laughs> just doesn't work. It. it can be both. So, you'll bet. The next person then can either complete the bet, meaning they raise it to the small bet, assuming you just did the the bring in, or and then after that they can raise in increments of whatever that small bet is, uh, and you go around until everyone has either folded or called or or whatever. Then you have, and that's known as Third Street because you're dealt four cards. Or three cards, rather. Then you'd go so, to fourth street. So the streets, the streets don't have to do with how many rounds of betting. It has to do with how many cards you've been dealt. So you get three cards, then you have the first round of betting. That's third street. Yeah. Uh, people don't use third street very often, but you do hear fourth street, fifth street, sixth, yeah. all of the other ones. To just let you know what round it is. It's similar to using the terminology pre-flop, flop, turn, and river in hold them. Um, so fourth street, everyone's dealt who is still in is dealt one more card. And then at that point in time, whoever has the best hand starts the action. So whoever has the highest cards, or if you have a pair, the highest pair at that point. And these are these are up cards. Uh so Correct. you Only got the first two down. down. Yeah, you got yep. the first two down, then you get the get get the next several up. Yep. So everyone can see who's got the best hand of the two cards. Correct. And at that, this point, they can either check or bet, where a bet is the size of the small bet. And then you go around and everyone calls or raises as appropriate. And again, typically raises are capped at either four or five raises, depending upon the room that you're playing in. Um, then you go to Fifth Street. Fifth Street is a magic street. That is where the bet doubles you're playing the big bet so you have three rounds of big bet in this game interesting which can kill you if there is any type of heavy action going on mm -hmm. so this is fifth street is the moment of truth street it's where you really need to be honest with yourself and don't chase anything that you don't have reasonable chances of making so you can often speculatively call third and fourth streets and see if something develops in your hand but you've got to have a solid draw or a solid hand to continue on fifth street so you want to be have it have a four cards to a made hand if you're going for a draw or a decent pair or decent low again this is a, a split pot game so you will be playing high and low and this is also a game that you can have some indirection because sometimes it will look like you just have a rock solid low where it, what you really have is quads or a full house or something like that. And no one else knows it at that particular point in time. So fifth, sixth and seventh street, they're all played the same way you, except for now you're doing big bets. The change that happens on seventh street, seventh street is another down card. So in the end, you will have four up cards and three down cards. And again, you are playing, it's exactly like we did with Omaha last month, where it's an eight or better qualifier. So your low, the worst card for your low has to be eight or better. And uh, again, five through ace is the best possible low card. And then the high uh, hand will also win half the pot. Okay, cool. So I can see as we're kind of building on these concepts, 
uh, it, 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 there's sort of less to explain because, you know, tune in last week or last month rather, and you can learn a lot about the other elements of like eight or better or the limit betting and, and that kind of thing. And so seven card stud is just a cool variant. This is one of the old fashioned kinds of games that like you draw poker that, you know, you used to see in the Westerns and that sort of thing. This is a game I used to play with my, um, family growing up around uh, the kitchen table and stuff like that, Taylor? Yeah, this is the the first game, though, where we're not playing communal cards. Mm. And we also have cards visible to, like, our hand. The draw games, it's not communal cards, but everything's hidden. This is now a game where you're playing your board against someone else's board. Like John said, eventually you're going to have four of your cards up. So a lot of this game becomes, what do my up cards show for me and how does the next one interact with that specific card and likewise for your opponent and paying attention to what they're getting for up cards versus what they had previously because this is a split pot game so we're playing for both the highs or the lows or potentially both so aces are great we can play for both the highs and the lows and our opponents don't know when our next card potentially helps or hurts our hand but when we play a hand that has a deuce or a three up usually more likely that we're playing for the low and then when a jack comes uh on the next card our opponents can tell that that's not good for us uh likewise when we play a jack or a queen and then a low card comes out that can be another detrimental thing to our hand it also works for our opponents and paying attention to what they have out there um so it it becomes a really fun game of observing and watching what your opponents are drawing into because you can see the times where their hand weakens or their hand strengthens, and you have to be able to uh, adapt to, to those different things. And, and I guess as players are folding, their up cards are getting removed and mucked. So it's really important to be paying attention to the up cards of every player in the early streets, because then you're going to know what cards are not available for hands mm-hmm. that people are trying to make on later streets. Like if you notice that someone's going for a flush draw, and you you know it, it matters if some of the players folded hearts on an earlier street. Yeah, it's yeah. more important in stud to pay attention than most other games because you have information available to you that is going to go away. When mm. someone folds, their up cards are no longer visible. But that was information that you should have and should be able to take into account. For example, let's say you're dealt ace, deuce, five, and everyone else in the board that you see preflop becomes you has a three or a four showing right 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 that's not great for your hand because (laughs) you know you're now limited chances of you getting the three or four are pretty low so you've eliminated a lot of your straights you've eliminated a lot of your low draws so that information is information you have and you should be making use of it i love that um any other thoughts here guys yeah taylor yeah, another thing. Uh, last week we talked, uh, or was it last? Yeah, it was last week, Omaha 8. We were talking about, month. hey, last be month. very aware last month. That's what uh, it was, yeah. That's that's the time frame I was thinking about. We were talking <laughs> about, like, hey, be, be cautious of eight high lows and, like, what that means because it's, you know, barely qualifying. In stud, eight or better, since you're not playing communal cards, just having a low becomes a very beneficial thing. John talked last month about how eights and nines aren't all that great. I, I feel like he's doing eights wrong by looping nines and win, win with them because <laughs> nines are like terrible in these games. Like they're just like downright worse. Um, but that becomes very clear in the stud eight because there's a clear line drawn between the value of having an eight versus having a nine uh, sh- showing or in your hand because that is the qualifying piece of if you can have an eight low or better. So if you have an eight low and you can see your opponent's cards and you know they have three cards showing that are higher than an eight, well, you're guaranteed half the pot in that situation where you have a made low that's eight or better and your opponent cannot possibly have a low. So you have to be very uh, paying attention to those different situations. So there is very much a clear line drawn between the value of an eight versus the value of a nine and the up cards that your opponents might potentially have. Rob? I was just going to say, it's uh, the other 
thing that is very, very similar to Omaha 8 is that you want to scoop. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's the biggest rule. You want to scoop. You want to be able to have the types of hands that can give you both the high and the low, and you can scoop. And I love what Taylor was saying because it's so easy to see what your opponent has and to determine the strength of your actual hand, um, much more so than in a flop game where everybody's cherrying cards. You don't know what their other cards are over here. You know exactly what four of their cards are going to be at the end, right? So it's very important. And there's another interesting um, little rhyme. Three big or three little, but never in the middle. <laughs> so if you're it. playing stud eight, you look for three cards that are high or big cards or three little cards, but never those medium cards because they're just going to get crushed either the high or the low. I love it. Great tip. Anything else uh, on stud eight or better gang or shall we? Turn this over to this fantastic phalanx of uh, poker pros and celebrities that are coming along right behind us here to offer some fantastic tips on how to play stud eight or better. So enjoy, and uh, we'll see you a little later on. All right, Chad McVean, give us some advice on how to play stud eight or better. Stud eight or better. Well, it is kind of like Omaha eight or better, where you definitely want to have a lean towards the low. But the one thing with stud is you have so many betting rounds that it's going to cost you a lot if you stay throughout the hand. You start with three cards, you're getting four more cards. That's five rounds of betting with the last two rounds being double. So that can cost you up to nine big bets, assuming no raises. So you want to start solid. If you don't have anything after the fourth, fifth card, just get out of there. All right, Chris Fox Wallace, uh, give me a tip on how to play stud eight or better. Man, I could talk about this game all day. I love this game. Nice. Uh, the stud eight variants are like my favorite games. Um, I think something that that you know most people won't tell you. I'm trying to come up with unique advice for these things because I know you're talking to a lot of people about these things. Something that people won't tell you is is the difference in in equity uh, for high hands depending on how many opponents you have. Uh, a pair of kings plays great heads up and miserably three or four handed. Uh, you know, ace deuce five plays great four handed and not all that well heads up. So learn it, go learn about that stuff and how much equity those things have. And then um, consider that when you're playing those pots. You know, should I be raising here with my ace deuce four when I'm heads up? No, especially against the guys showing a king. Why are you raising? You're not. You're not great. If it's two, three, four, really don't raise. You know, you don't even have an overcard then, right? You're just you're just hoping that you're low or some sort of bet miracle high comes in. So, uh, you know, if it's folded around to you in late position, don't be afraid to raise that pair of kings or that, or or especially that six that has a buried pair of kings. That's a great you know great spot for that. Raise that up from from almost any position because you're trying to limit the field. But if there's a bunch of low cards behind you and you think four people are going to call, just throw those kings away. They're no good. All right, Mike Patrick, uh, give me some advice on how to play stud eight or better. All right. Best tip I can give you guys for stud eight or better is right in the name of the game. It is stud eight or better. If you see a nine or a 10 or something on in those ranges, you, you no, just no, throw it away. You don't want a nine or a 10 in your hand. They're the worst cards in the deck in your hand. You can have uh, an ace up with a deuce in the hole and your other cards a nine. It's useless. Uh, you're basically handcuffing yourself by one card uh, going forward as soon as you see a card like that. So basically you always want to have three to a low. If you're going to go that way, you do not want to have uh, like a reverse dangler as if it was, you know, a PLO hand where you don't want the baby. In study, you don't want the one random high card. So if you are starting out with, you know, a nice low connected hand uh, with two, three, four or three, four, six of all of one suit or uh, ace four, five, uh, something like that, you're going to be in way better shape. As soon as you see a nine or a 10 in your hand, just fuck it. It's just not going to be worth it. All right, Kathy Chang, give me some advice on how to play stud eight or better. 
So stat eight or better, it's similar to 08 in that you want to try to get a high hand and a low hand to scoop. And so to do that, a good starting hand would be like, say, for instance, three of a kind, which we would call instead rolled up. And then also three low cards to straight flush, like say ace, deuce, three of hearts that you could win the high hand. You could possibly win the low hand. And it's it's really fun to play these these hands because in stud, the bring-in would be usually the low card. In stud eight, the low card could also be of help to you. And so if you have a deuce as your up card, that could help potentially give you the five card that you need for the low or the five cards that you need for the high, and you could proceed along that way. All right, Robbie Straczynski, give me some advice on how to play stud eight or better. If you've got a high hand, like a good main high hand early on uh, during the action on third street, fourth street, make the lows pay to get them. You see people chasing, like they got a two and a three. You've already got like a you know pocket kings down or even pocket nines, something like that, or split aces, something of that degree. Charge them. You know, don't get uh, all panicked. Oh, they may get the low on me. Make them hit that low first. You know, make charge them the, the maximum. So highs can be okay. You know, just make sure you don't get scooped by sevens. Okay, Shannon Vandenberg, uh, give me some tips on how to play stud eight or better. Stud eight or better, top three tips. Um, it's a beautiful game, stud eight. I really like it. It's one of my favorite games. Starting hands, you're starting three cards are the key, and you want to start with scooping hands or really strong one-way hands. Rolled up low cards, so rolled up three of a kind in your first three starting cards, um, are better than nine plus because you can still make backdoor lows. And you're also blocking some low cards for your opponents um, for them making wheels and so on. Um, and the third thing would be start getting used to remembering the up cards of everybody else's hand. So whether it be their starting third, their, so their face card, but also when there's players in the pot, start remembering what got dealt to each player that's now folded out of the pot? How would it have helped your hand? How could it be helping somebody else's hand? Are they blocking you as a blocking them? So you need to you need to think, you get a lot of information in the stud rounds. You need to start remembering. All right. Well, that was another fun conversation about mixed games. Uh, my thanks to, of course, the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Casino for their support over the years. Um, to John Somsky and the other members of our Wrecking Crew panel here talking about their love of mixed games, and all our fantastic guests who contributed their uh, segments, their thoughts and tips and advice on how to get the most out of uh, some different mixed games that we're going to be playing. So I'd encourage you, head on over to Rec.Poker, sign up for a free account there. Uh, you can go to rec.poker slash home game and find out all about the different mixed games that are being played throughout the year, a different one every month. And I would encourage our listeners, if you're a No Limit Hold'em player, dip a toe into some of the mix games. You'll be surprised how much fun you can have. So uh, without further ado, I'll just say thanks for joining us for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. And I hope I get to see you all again next week or sometime real soon. Uh, good luck on the felt, folks. Thanks again. Bye for now. Thank you.